With the amount of physics going on at a racetrack, Newton would definitely love racing. We went to see a tire test at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway and to hang out with our friend Julian from the Chip Ganassi race team and learn a little bit more about the forces and physics involved with their cars. Looks like today we're at one of the coolest science experiments around. Tell us a little bit about what's going on back here. What we do is we have the control tire, as we call it, is the tire from last year's Indy 500, the 2008. We only have one variable at a time. First, we run through different constructions where we keep the same compound or rubber on the tire. Then we have a control tire where we keep the construction the same and change the rubber or the compound on each tire. From that, we pick the best combination and compare that against our control tire to try and produce a better combination tire the next year. And I guess you keep lots of records, uh, so your, your science journal is your race journal. <laughs> yeah, our, sci our race journals are very sophisticated. There's literally hundreds of things you can change on the car, so we have all that specified. And in addition to doing it with the tires, we get some time at a test like this where we change variables on our car. Uh -huh. And again, it's how well you do the experiments. So let's talk a little bit about the forces of these tires. Why do you need a really good tire uh, in a race car like this? We need grip from the tire to go around the corner as fast as we can. We need to generate as much force as we can from the tire. We do that with the tire rubber or compound, mm -hmm. the actual grip of the tire. And the whole car is designed to give aerodynamic downforce, which is a force, a vertical force downwards through the car to push mm -hmm. it onto the track. And we have three or four major components that have the biggest effect. The rear wing is one. This is like a wing of an aeroplane, but instead of on an aeroplane where it lifts the aeroplane up, we actually put it on the car upside down to push the really? car down. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same as an aircraft wing in principle. Okay, so the rear wing pushes, has downforce. Yeah. Now you say the actual body of the car does also? Yeah, the underneath of the car, which we can't really see here, is shaped like a Venturi so that as the air passes through it, it speeds up as the Venturi constricts it down and produces a low pressure, which sucks the car onto the ground also. And then we balance all that with a front wing, which again is a front aerofoil, like an aircraft aerofoil just flipped upside down. And we change the angle of this so that we balance what we're doing with the rear wing. Uh, because if you put all the grip on the rear, then the driver wouldn't be able to steer it if he had You're no grip on the front. Mm -hmm. You need a balance of front to rear grip to make the car go around the corner. Now I see other moment. little subtle things on it, like these uh, mirrors, they, uh, they look like they've been designed for aerodynamics. Is that true also? Yeah, they're really sculpted. We've put hundreds and potentially even thousands of hours in testing different mirror shapes. So basically, if you've got all these down forces, when you go up on a curve, that holds you against the side of the track. How high yeah. up can you go on a curve? Well, the car produces enough grip that we could actually drive around on the ceiling. Really? Completely <laughs> upside down, <laughs> quite happily. Maybe someday somebody will do it just to prove yeah. it can be done. But it would be relatively easy to drive around on the ceiling, well, as long as you kept your speed up. You kept your speed up and you had your down forces. This yeah. is all a balance of between Newton's laws, friction, and our friend gravity at yeah. all times. Well, today we've been investigating how things hold on the track and how things accelerate, but Newton also had some laws about deacceleration. Yeah. So let's talk about what happens when you come to a quick stop. Uh, what, what do we have to keep the driver safe? There's a lot of work goes into these cars on safety. It's all designed and it's crash tested, uh, run into brick walls and that kind of thing to mm -hmm. make sure it behaves in a proper manner to absorb the energy to stop it getting through to the driver. We also have what we call is a crash box, which is supplied by the Indy Racing League for Indy cars. And that sole purpose is to record the G signature or the acceleration signature when you have an accident. So they can look at how well the car stood up to a certain magnitude mm -hmm. of accident. By measuring the forces, you can kind of categorize that, oh, this was a you know, a really big accident. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what happened. And it records exactly what the car saw in terms of forces. And you can look at how it was damaged and start relating wow. the two and improving its response to those damage situations. You know, I'll tell you, uh, Isaac Newton would have loved to hear you say what you just said yeah. about G-forces and mass and acceleration because he worked out the math of this hundreds yeah. of years ago. Yeah. But I don't think you ever dreamed that 
one day a red car like an apple would be yeah. out on the Indianapolis track uh, yeah. putting these things to test. That's and it's all amazing. still the same math as he dreamt up all those years ago. It's just been expanded its uses since then. That's amazing. Well, Julian, I can't wait to see this out on the track. And okay. we'll, put, we'll put all your work to the test yeah. today. stays at rest until the force acts upon it. That was a big force. We've been out to the track to see how fast these cars go, but now I get a chance to visit one of the coolest science labs in the whole United States. I'm here at Chip Ganassi Racing and seeing the science to make these cars go fast. Hey Julian, how you doing? Hi, good thanks. Well, what do you got going here? Yeah, this is the Indianapolis race shop where we're working on, this is actually the gearbox shop we're in at the moment, we're working on ways to make the cars faster. So I'm looking around here and I see some pretty cool things. I, I, there's, it looks like there's projects everywhere. Yeah, there's, we run the different cars out of here. We run Indy cars, we run the Grand Am sports cars. These guys in the gearbox shop work on gearboxes for all the different kind of cars we run. So Julian, there's a lot of activity going on here. What's going on in this room? Yeah, like this is where all the Indy cars and our Grand Am sports cars come together. This is an Indy car like we run at the Indy 500 Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And it's just starting to come together. That's the basic tub the driver sits in. Mm -hmm. This is a completed gearbox. We mm -hmm. saw the gearbox shop earlier where it was being worked on. This is a complete unit ready mm -hmm. to go. We're working on the bell housing there. Mm -hmm. Gradually these parts will come together and they'll then come to form the complete car you see here. Wow, uh, these are starting to look more familiar like parts of a race car. So what's going on here? Yeah, this is the bodywork for each car. Each car has its own rack identified with a number. Huh. You've got the engine cover, the side pods, the under tray, all the carbon fiber parts that bolt to the basic cover of the car mm -hmm. to start making an aerodynamic hole. Everybody's heard of fiberglass, which mm -hmm. is what you make boats out of and that kind of thing. That's quite cheap and not super strong. Carbon fiber is super strong for its weight, which is why we mm -hmm. use it in molding instead of things like fiberglass. It mm -hmm. needs a lot of man hours because the way these parts are built up is with sheets of carbon fiber. This is the carbon room where we make carbon fiber parts like the bodywork we mm -hmm. just showed you. Well, I don't see any carbon here. I see uh, rolls of stuff on the wall. Yeah, some we keep on the wall, some we keep in the fridge. Wait a minute, you, got, you have carbon in the freezer here. Yeah, it's stored <laughs> cold because it lasts much longer that way. I gotta see this. So here's some pieces of carbon. In the freezer, so it lasts longer. So this must be some expensive stuff. Huh? Yeah, these are just a few off cuts. Mm -hmm. The expensive rolls are down the bottom. So this is raw carbon fiber. It's got some back in here we can remove. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a thin, flexible mat. This side, uh, I can see the fibers on it, and uh, this side seems sticky though. So what, how do you activate this uh, on the stickiness on there? So what we do if we're making a part, we have a mold. Uh -huh. This is a typical mold. This is a machined aluminum one. We make them out of different types okay, so of this, material. So this is the mold that you're gonna make the part on. Yeah, then we lay up. This gets cut to shape, laid in the mold. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes we get bubbles or something like yeah, that. Yeah, because how do you keep it? How do you keep all the uh, air out of it? Well, then we vacuum bag it. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so you got a vacuum bag here hooked up to the air. Mm -hmm. And what are you going to do here? You got a valve in there. Part of it's inside. Part mm -hmm. of it's outside with a rubber seal on there. And we've got seal tape on the ends here of this tube. And wow. it sucks it all down. This part's already been cured, so mm -hmm. it already has um, the extra resin in there. So that, that makes it a uniform push, uh, uh, a PSI or pressure against it, so in the, your, your finished product is the way you want it. Yes. So when you, when you take that out, is this what you end up with, Julian? Yeah, it goes in an oven to cure, and that's the finished part, which came straight off this mold. You get quite a nice surface finish because the vacuum bag pushes everything together. Wow, really solid. that's amazing science. The technology that goes from carbon fibers to someone who's skilled to make this part to pulling a vacuum on it to heating it to the racetrack. That yeah. is a lot of cool things going on here. And vacuum is our friend. It's a pretty powerful thing. If you pull a vacuum, that's 15 pounds per square inch. 
say over that part, which is probably 500 square inches, that's mm -hmm. like 7,500 pounds pushing down on mm -hmm. that part. You wouldn't be able to do that by putting books no. on it or anything or like that, or hands. holding it with your hand. Okay, Julian, uh, I noticed that was a small piece, but these are bigger pieces. Do you pull a whole vacuum on these, or what is going on here? Depends how big it is. Like this, it would be hard to pull a whole vacuum on it because it's so big, mm -hmm. but you can pull a vacuum on part of it. This is actually the nose off one of our Grand Am sports cars. You can see here it's been damaged during a race, so we're going to repair it. We'll grind that out, put some carbon fibre on it, put a local vacuum bag on it there, and mm -hmm. then let it cure. Once it's come out and everything's cured and it's back to its normal strength, then we'll repaint it. Things are prepared for paint over there and then go into the paint booth and get a paint job. The designs of all these are worked out by engineers. Yeah, we build what we call a solid model of the car on the CAD. CAD is computer-aided design. So he can make a, a full size or an accurate representation of the real car. And when he designs parts, we can check how they fit in with all the other parts mm -hmm. by looking at a, a solid model, as we call it. So this uh, modeling is a pretty important part of science, and so you guys take modeling to like the, <laughs> the highest degree. Yeah, and we can actually analyze the parts using finite element analysis, we call it, which is mm -hmm. working out the stresses and loads within a part. Mm -hmm. but we apply loads to a part, and it then calculates the stresses within it. Boy. Other things we can do, and we're just starting to get into it, is what we call computational fluid dynamics. Say that again? Computational fluid dynamics, so CFD, mm -hmm. which is where computers predict the airflow over the car. Instead <laughs> of using a wind tunnel or something like that, you use the computer to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you can look at how the air flows over the car, what the forces are on the car, and then change the shape of the car to improve the forces. That's our friend Bernoulli. No, it's been great talking to you, Julian, and learning about the science, but I'm looking for kind of a hands-on guy. Do you have anybody around here that uh, I can try out some science tricks with, maybe? Yeah, I've got just the guy for you, Grant Weaver. He runs our gearbox shop, and he, he runs the whole shop while we're away racing. Just the guy? Is he kind of a nerdy science guy? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, great. Uh, I'll look, let's see if we can find Grant. Okay, this is Grant Weaver. He runs the whole race shop. Hey, Grant. How are you doing? Hey, Rick, how are you? Good. I hear that not only you like racing, but you like science, too. I love science. <laughs> I, I like so. racing a little bit more, but I do love science. Grant showed us around the truck bay. He explained to us that all the race teams have what is essentially a mobile science lab. Here they observe their car's performance data while it's out on the track. We take three trailers to the IRL races, and each one of these trailers is set up differently. Mm -hmm. And they have enough parts to rebuild the cars a couple times over if we need to. A couple to times? At the racetrack. Mm -hmm. uh, each one's set up a little bit differently, and they all house different uh, parts, pieces, equipment, and that sort of thing, so that we can do whatever we need to at the racetrack mm -hmm. to try to make the car go faster than it was the session before. Now, this is still a science, so just when you got everything figured out, Usually something goes wrong, right? Well, every now and then something does. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully we've done our homework. Like you said, it is a science and it's not exact. So we spend an awful lot of time trying to go through the different scenarios in different manners and forms, either on a computer, through simulations and that sort of thing, so that we've got an educated guess as to what we need to do at the racetrack. He also told us that all the old race cars become show cars and even showed us some of the Chip Ganassi championship cars from years past. Man, I mean, this uh, you guys are going to uh, run out of wall space one of these days. I bet there's people that see this at home and go, wow, I remember that car. Wow, that remember that race. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. This is an amazing race car collection on the wall. On the wall. <laughs> Getting a behind-the-scenes tour was pretty awesome, but there was one more thing I wanted to investigate before we left the shop. Grant, there's a lot of science going on around here, but I wouldn't mind trying a little Isaac Newton experiment that you and I might try. You game for that? Sure. Okay, so Grant, we've set up this kind of impromptu Isaac Newton experiment about his third law. For every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. And what I hope will happen is you'll be able to hit these tires. What do you think is going to happen with that? Well, hopefully it'll uh, give a reaction at the opposite end of the row of tires. And that energy will transfer through. Transfer from this tire onto the fourth one in line. Well, I don't imagine in all, uh, Isaac Newton's wildest dreams he thought he would try this, but <laughs> let's give it a shot. Go on, all let's right, give it your best go. roll here. Awesome. This one came back, and that one kept on going. 
I guess Isaac Newton was right even in the racing. <laughs> Grant, thanks for taking time to show us uh, around today. You're very welcome, Rick.